J-Mac completely goes in on false teachers. To this kind of muck, in a vast religious Ponzi scheme that makes the people at the top of the Ponzi pile filthy rich. But let's talk about it here on All Things Theology. Cue my theme music. All Things Theology, All Things Theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hallowed because this is how we do it at All Things Theology. Yo, grace and peace, and welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology, where this is your host, K-Dub. Today, we're going to talk about John MacArthur. Man, he was going for some heads in this sermon. He calling out all the prosperity preachers and their tactics. Y'all know how we like to do it. We like to get straight into it. So let's talk about it here. Let's go. I have actually had people over the last few years come to me and tell me how greatly and spiritually changed they were by reading a book called The Secret. You may have seen it in an airport bookstore written by Rhonda Byrne. It sold and still selling, by the way, in double-digit millions. For a while, it was going at 150,000 books a month, wow. which is pretty good. Uh, the Secret is a book based on Eastern uh, pantheism, I guess you could say. All things are one. Uh, you are one with the universe, um, we are the light, we are the I am, we are the truth, we are God. That's uh, some of that Eckhart Tolle nonsense. Now, this theology that it's describing might sound familiar, and I think this, I believe, not think, I know that this theology has uh, woven its way inside of many mainstream evangelical churches, unfortunately, and we got to call it out. We got to call it what it is. Let's keep going. Sense. But the appeal of the secret is that you have within you the force, the energy, the power to create whatever kind of life you want. Now, you can find this book in Christian bookstores. But if your Christian bookstore doesn't carry it, they probably would be happy to order it for you. <laughs> But they might have another book there that uh, would serve just as well. It's called The Shack. Have y'all, y'all, that there was a movie that came out not too long ago, but obviously based on this book. And The Shack, unfortunately, has been perpetuated by uh, many Christians, like The Jesus Calling, unfortunately. It's, it's a non Christian film, non Christian book, although it parades itself as Christian, just like Jesus Calling, but it's a lot of New Age theology, unfortunately. But he's going to describe why this book is not Christian. Now, I have had Christian people who have been Christians for a long time sit down with me, one recently at dinner, and say, uh, do, did, you, did you read The Shack? I, I thought it was a great Christian book. And um, my meal was, at that moment, totally ruined because this is a, this is a person right. who's been a believer for like 40 years. Oh, man. Another multi-million seller written by William Young, and there are a couple of other sort of ancillary products written by a few other authors on the subject of finding God in the shack. The message, again, is this. You have so much power in you that you literally can create reality by speaking it. Nonsense. The internal creative power that resides in you can be released in words. And these words have supernatural energy that literally create the world the way you want the world to be. That now, what theology do we hear perpetuating uh, this New Age theology today? Again, we're going to talk about it further, but... I just want you to answer in the comment section and the chat section as we're going along. Let's see if you're just in tuned and listening. Literally give you the circumstances and the situations and the relationships and the achievements and the accomplishments and the fulfillments and satisfactions that you want. Now, there are some problems with the shack that are obvious. God is not an obese African-American woman. That would be one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the shack presents God uh, as a as a obese, yeah, black woman. Yeah, that's right. They go watch the movie. Well, don't go watch the movie, but you can go watch the trailer, see images of the shack. That'll probably come up. 
yeah, God's a woman in the shack. Um, I'm not sure about the book, but definitely the film. Well, the book does portray God as a woman, but not sure about the obese black woman part. But definitely the film has God as a woman. Right. I mean, so you can see already the theology coming out from the shack is not Christian. But unfortunately, it's sold in Christian uh, bookstores. Christians read it and they love it. But it's not coming from a paradigm that is Christian right off the bat. One problem to consider in the book. But there are other problems in the book that um, I find distressing. One is that the heart of the book is called the law of attraction, the law of attraction. That is that your thoughts and your words control the universe by attracting to you the things you speak. The operational principle that makes the universe that you live in the way you want it operates on the laws of attraction. You speak a certain thing, and by speaking it, you have the sheer power to attract it and literally make it reality. This is how you do it, in case you were wondering. One, know what you want. I mean, you've got to start there. You, you can't attract anything until you know what you want to attract. Number two, believe you will get it. And this is really the important one, because um, if you just can't quite believe you're going to get it, you're not going to get it. So faith is the real power, faith in yourself, in believing. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of theologies teach this, you know, faith, faith actually becomes some kind of power which grants you what you want, you know, and, and then some people have taught, you know, have critiqued uh, certain theologies as having a faith in faith where you're, you're trusting your ability to have this a great amount of faith. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't teach none of this nonsense, right? Even you can create your own reality. Know what you want. Believe you will get it. Visualize the very experience of fulfillment as if you have it. No. And then speak out loud. And you will then at that point have released enough power to attract this reality Nonsense. to you. Here's a line from The Secret. It works every time. And every person and in every person. Just place your order, and it is yours." It says that. So, and then, yeah, some have, you know, in the prosperity gospel taught this as well, where um, they've, I've heard some say, like, you don't even have to be Christian, but if you apply these principles to your life, I, Robin Morris has used that in effect to talking about tithing. If you apply these principles in your life, it will work. All you have to do is believe and trust in it and, and, and act upon it. The same kind of principle from pagan sources, right? Uh, and that's ultimately where the prosperity gospel has its roots. It's in paganism. It's in uh, new thought, in, in conscious move, new age movements, not in, not in the Bible. And you say, well, how, how can anybody believe that? How can anybody be stupid enough to believe that? That your thoughts and your words create the world to accommodate you, that reality is literally the result of your own decision. What you think, what you believe, what you visualize, what you speak will actually come to pass. That's what it says in The Secret. That's what it says in The Shack. You will rearrange the universe. Mm. To put it another way, maybe borrowing some theological terms, you are in charge of providence. Mm. God is not. Mm. You have the power. Yeah, you know, there's a theologist taught, Miles Monroe taught this, that God needs permission from us to act in this world. And he thought, he, he stated that that's the theology of prayer. He stated prayer is the theology of giving God permission to act and he needs a human agent to do this. Now this is utter nonsense, right? God can do as he pleases, but there are the major theology teaching what John MacArthur is uh, exposing here. You have the energy of the universe. These are quotes. You create your world. You are the designer of your destiny. You are the author of your story or your movie. 
as well as the star. The outcome is what you choose. So faith is this powerful, personal, creative force, this supernatural energy that overcomes all restraint, objection, and resistance, and literally gives you exactly what you want the way you want it. And you can have whatever you desire. And by the way, have you ever checked the desire list? You know what shows up on that list? I've checked it, and I don't see humility. I don't see brokenness, penitence, virtue, holiness, worship, sacrifice, unselfishness, love, heaven. No, not so much. Yeah, it's always things you want naturally. It's never, hey, Lord, help me to rid this sin. Right. As these words of power never are to do that, which is actually to prescribed in the Bible. Right. Health, wealth, success, all that stuff that's temporal and material and perishing. Now, if all that sounds familiar to you and you've never read The Secret or The Shack, then you've been watching TBN. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have, because that's where you have become familiar with this. Yes. You have been exposed, sadly, to this kind of muck in a vast religious Ponzi scheme that makes the people at the top of the Ponzi pile filthy rich. That's right. That's right. It uh, comes in forms like this, the word faith movement, the prosperity gospel, the name it and claim it movement, and names like Hinn and Hickey and Price and Meyer and Copeland and Hagee and Tilton and Kuntz and Roberts and Hagen and Crouch and many more lesser lights. Call them out. If you can be a lesser light. They all claim that every so-called Christian has the personal power to recreate life's reality into exactly what he wants. Mm. The only thing they add is they throw the name of Jesus in. That's all right. And uh, Jesus is just waiting to be activated <laughs> by by you knowing what you want, believing that you're going to get it, visualizing it and speaking it. Mm. It's a very successful Ponzi scheme. These people are really, really good at what they do. Mm. And they take most advantage of the desperate and the lonely and the isolated and the ignorant. And I always think about the Lord Jesus at the uh, temple. I want you to listen to this because this passage has been often used as a passage, passage to manipulate people to give. I've talked about this text before. I want you to listen to what he's talking about here. Last week of his life, when he sat there, it says, and he watched a widow come by and put two coins in a temple offering receptacle, trumpet shape. There were 13 of them in the courtyard. And the woman came up and put her two coins in the temple, and it was all that she had. Remember that? And we think that's an illustration of sacrificial giving. Exactly. That is not an illustration of sacrificial giving. It's not. It is not a virtue to give everything you have and go home and die. That's right. And even further to substantiate the point, uh, one of the passages that talks about it in the uh, Gospels is Luke uh, 21. But even prior to that, in Luke 20, verses 45 through 46, let me read this passage. It says, uh, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, right? The best seats in the synagogues, a place of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. He says, They will receive the greater condemnation. And then you go to the next chapter, verse 1. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper co coins. It's almost ironic. Jesus actually is teaching about widows being devoured, looks up and sees a very great, 
a very example of that. This is not a passage on giving your last. This is a passage of what false doctrine does to even the smallest and least of these. That's what this passage is about. That is not what God asked from you, but that is what the system asked from her. And the next words out of the mouth of Jesus were these, not one stone in this place will remain on top of another one. Mm. This religion that does this is coming down. Wow. Wow. God sat in judgment that day as Christ watched that widow drop her last two coins in a final effort to buy the blessing of God and buy heaven and buy eternal life because that was what was proffered by that scheming system which was making the people at the top, namely the corrupt Sadducees, filthy rich at the expense of the people. And it's little wonder that qu twice our Lord cleansed that place. Yeah, another point to buttress this is why would, why would Jesus be congratulating uh, this woman given to a false system? I mean, it literally makes no sense. We have to start asking these questions with uh, texts like this uh, where people just try to say, hey, look, it's good to give all you have. Jesus is not condoning giving to a false system, right? Any religion that takes advantage of the sick and the poor and the weak comes under divine judgment. That's right. That's right. Well, all of that leads me to the star of the day, Joel Osteen. <laughs> I regret that he has replaced me on Larry King. It drives me completely nuts. You, you guys should watch Joel Osteen on Larry King versus John MacArthur. Quite vast difference there. <laughs> Mike Horton in Christless Christianity, page 68, said, uh, Osteen has achieved the dubious success of making the name it and claim it teaching of Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn mainstream. Mm -hmm. There's some truth in that, absolutely. Pat Robertson commends Joel Osteen. Of all people, Max Lucado, the largest selling Christian author, commends Joel Osteen. Which Max Lucado, ironically enough, has taken over as a temperate pastor at Robert Morris's church. Interesting enough. Ed Young Jr. commends Joel Osteen, Southern Baptist pastor, Dallas. That's pretty mainstream. Let me see if I can set the record straight. Joel Osteen is a pagan religionist, a legalist, and a quasi pantheist. Mm. Mm. I'm not done. <laughs> this is my pulpit. I can be here as long as I want. <laughs> now, on the other side of that, Jesus Christ is a footnote to satisfy His critics, thrown in at the end to get people off His back That's right. who are irritated by the absence of Christ in His ministry. And what is he saying? What is his message? We save ourselves from all the things we don't want, all the things that are wrong in our lives by our own internal divine faith power. That's his whole operation. In his book, Your Best Life Now, and by the way, I want to hasten to say He's absolutely right. If you believe in what he says in that book, this will be your best life. It'll be a whole lot better than the next one. He is absolutely right. If, but if you want your best life now, go for his theology. If you want your best life forever, avoid it. That's right. What does he say in your best life now? He says that um, we are able to create by our faith and our words the dreams we dream and the desires we have, health, wealth, happiness, success, all the same old, same old temporal things. Quote, if you develop an image of success, an image of health and abundance and joy and peace and happiness, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. 
end quote. Here's another one. All of us are born for earthly greatness. You were born to win. You were born to be a champion. Tell that to the 20 handicapper. God wants you to live in abundance. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. Before we were formed, He prepared us to live abundant lives, to be happy, healthy, <clears throat> and whole. But when our thinking... Yeah, it's what I call the gospel of Pharrell, right? God just wants you happy, right? Just smiling all the time like Joel Osteen. And, you know, this, this, this is why the Word of Faith people, they cannot, they don't have a good theology of suffering because in them, suffering is from the devil. But if you read passages like Philippians 129, where he grants your suffering, you know, this will cause great confusion, right? You know what I mean? Becomes contaminated. It is no longer in line with God's Word. By the way, when he says God's Word, he's not talking about the Bible. That's right. He's talking about what you believe to be intuitively the voice of God talking to you, mm. telling you what you ought to be, creating your wish list. Get your thinking positive, he says, and he'll bring your desires to pass. He regards you as a strong, courageous, successful person. You are on your way to a new level of glory. Now, how do you do this? Here is his list. Believe, visualize, speak out loud. Same list. You got to know what you want, believe it, mm -hmm. visualize it, speak it out loud. Now, what you can see is Joel Osteen is parroting a lot of the theology found in The Secret, the non-Christian uh, book, right, that a lot of these prosperity preachers have embodied as well. Out loud. Your words literally release this life-giving power. Here's some more quotes. Friend, there's a miracle in your mouth. <laughs> Isaiah might have a problem with that as I think about it. <laughs> Here's Joel Osteen's prayer. I thank you, Father. This is his own prayer. I thank you, Father, that I have your favor. Does that sound familiar? Luke 18, I thank you, Father, that I'm not like other men, even like that publican. Here's another quote. I, I know these principles are true because they work for me and my wife. Of course. Of course, you're at the top of the Ponzi pile. Everybody's sending you their money. Exactly. <laughs> and then he says, how do I know they work? Because I found a perfect parking spot at the mall. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> what about the poor little old lady that was waiting behind you for that parking spot? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now, the good news is that all of this has some theology behind it, some theology proper. He says, God has already done everything He's going to do. The ball is in your court. Mm. Mm. This seems to me like hyper-Pelagianism, mm. Pelagianism on steroids. <laughs> well, at this point, I think we've heard enough to recognize the real source of His religion. Are you having trouble with that? Himself. He is a mouthpiece for Satan. Mm. He's an agent for Satan. How do I know that? Because he offers all the things that the unregenerate heart already wants. That's right. First John 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is of the world and is passing away. That's Satan's strategy. Think about it in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 when our, our Lord was being tempted by the devil. What did He do? He appealed to the desires of the Lord's heart apart at the moment, from, apart from the, the will of God for the moment. That's right. Satan is the one who first offered our Lord the prosperity gospel, and Jesus rejected it. You shouldn't be hungry. You should be full. You shouldn't be rejected. You should be accepted. You shouldn't be insignificant. You should rule the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you everything that you want. And every time he answered with Scripture, right? That's right. It's not the first time 
nor the last time, nor any isolated situation where somebody parades himself as a minister of Jesus Christ who is in fact a minister of Satan because we know from Paul's letter to the Corinthians that the devil himself is an angel of light and his agents are disguised the same way, right? That's, that's right. Why, why are these people so successful? Be, because Satan is behind the enterprise and he is appealing to that which is the natural desire of the unregenerate heart. Everything the unconverted sinner wants is what these people are offering in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's so good. I'm going to put the full link in that, that, uh, down in the description so you can check out later. But that's so true. What makes false teaching so deceptive is sometimes they share true things. And based on those true things, many people get deceived and they ignore the little things. They are, they are blinded by them. But again, we have to expose false teachers, as the Bible says, to mark those who cause division. And it's false teachers who cause division, not those who call out false teachings. Hope you guys enjoy this video. Till the next time, grace and peace. Yo, grace and peace. Thank you for watching another episode of All Things Theology. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go on and give me a like. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. I promise to give you weekly lives, videos, interactions, exposing false teachers, sharing with you, the viewer, my theological beliefs, things about the culture and the Bible. So if you're here for that, come on and join us. Also, if you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Links are in the description below. You can see content before it drops. You can also have Q&A sessions with also other Patreon members, YouTube members as well. So if you would like that, hit the description link in below. Everybody.